time to come together and to just worship, to take a moment out of our life, out of our busyness, and to spend time together, but also with God in worship. So why don't we stand? We're going to start with some singing.
morning, good to see you all. Uh, glad that you're here. Um, as a church, we're on a path to a Jesus way, and we have a mission statement we like to say together, so let's try it together. Get your hands ready to go. Our mission, on the path to a Jesus way by... You can try it. All right, send the slide off. Here we go. All right, start us. You know, when you're sitting there, it's an easy thing. But you get up here, all of a sudden. Okay, our... Merciful God, we praise you. We praise you for your goodness to us. Even in these strange and difficult times, you are good, and we praise you. Even though things aren't normal, you are good, and we praise you. In this election that's coming soon, you are good, and you are in control, and we praise you. Even though we don't agree on some of the issues that face us these days, we can agree that you are good and we praise you. We thank you, God, for providing for us in this, in this day. We thank you, along with Jason and Amanda, for their little baby, Tobias. We lift up to you, uh, Ben Sutter at this time, for Tom, for Peggy Barron's daughter, Tracy, with you, Tina and Andy, as uh, she's waiting for therapy. And we pray along with uh, John and Katie Dextra for Katie's brother, Gil, and, uh, and the cancer that he it has and then spread throughout his body and he's on hospice. So we pray for God's presence for them, for you to be with them and give them peace in this time. We also thank you that uh, Jennifer has got a temper. Uh, temporary job for the next couple months, and we pray along with uh, the families of uh, high school seniors and high school seniors themselves as they look to colleges in this time. God, we ask, also ask you to be with us, to be with Pathway Church as we look to the future, as uh, we, uh, in this difficult time, we ask you to be with Steve and Marie as they move on. As we look to the future as well, be with Pastor Jim. And be with us as leaders in our programs. We thank you again for your goodness to us. And we thank you for your love. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, somebody has to get up. I have to get up. Somebody's beeping. You have to get up now. You're an alarm, right? You have to get out of bed now. Or you have to do something, right? All right. <laughs> you know, growing up, I always believed in, you know, the omnipotence of God, that God is all powerful. And then someone came to me with this question that made me wonder about it. The question was, can God make a rock so big that he can't pick it up? You have to think about it. Right? Can God make a rock so big that he can't 
Well, if God can do anything, of course he can make a rock that he can't pick up, and he can't, you know, no matter which way you go with it, somehow God is limited. And so I think that, I got that question when I was 10 years old, and when I was 10, I decided that when I grew up, I was going to write a book that answered all these kinds of questions. <laughs> all these questions that don't have a really good answer, all the paradoxes and, uh, you know, things like that. And uh, I have a lot of these questions, but I have not written the book. Well, today we have kind of one of these dilemmas or one of these paradoxes trying to understand. Uh, in our reading in 1 Timothy chapter 2, uh, let me get to it. Okay, 1 Timothy, I'll read the first verse just because it relates to our times, doesn't relate to what I want to say. Paul says, by the way, Paul is writing to Timothy. Timothy has been his young lieutenant. He's been training him, mentoring him, taking him on journeys, and he sends Timothy to go to this church or that church and make things happen. So he's trying to encourage Timothy in his work. He says, I urge then, first of all, first, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all the godliness and holiness. I think that's an appropriate verse for the next couple of weeks. All right, verse 3 is the one I want to talk about. So this follows those two verses. This is good and pleases God our Savior, and here's the phrase, who wants all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So God wants all people to be saved. God can do anything. So if God can do anything and he wants everyone saved, why doesn't he just save everybody? Is he not powerful enough? Can God make a rock so big that he can't lift it? Or is, is salvation, you know, why doesn't God just make salvation so attractive that no one can say no? You know, like ice cream. If salvation was ice cream, who would say no? Right? Ice cream, you scream, we all scream for ice cream. Who doesn't want it? Or um, is God's grace somehow limited? Like God's grace, he's offering it, but people can just say no. Is that right? You know, 500 years ago, people started reading the Bible. It's called the Reformation. And people started writing um, little um, instructional manuals about what the Bible says. Today we have what we know as the Heidelberg Catechism. We have the Belgian Confession. But we have another one called the Canons of Dort. If the canons were writings, and Dort was the city that it was written. And there's five things, and those were known as the five points of Calvinism. And as a kid, I knew them as TULA. Total, total depravity, you unconditional uh, election, L, limited atonement, I, I'll come back to P, perseverance of the saints. The I stood for irresistible grace. In other words, God's grace is irresistible. You can't resist God's grace. So again, if you can't resist God's grace, how do people do it? Because it sure seems like people do. So is God just not offering his grace to everyone? Well, the, the, the answer that we've traditionally talked about is, well, God doesn't want to force his grace on anyone. It's your decision. It's a personal decision. If you want his grace, take his grace. If you don't want his grace, then don't take his grace. It's up to you. But if you were a parent and you have a 10-year-old child in a burning building, would you call in and say, hey, the, burning is, uh, the building is burning, and I can come in and save you if you want? You'd give that as a choice? Or would you just rush into the building and grab them and say, I don't care what you want. You're coming out. Yeah, so why doesn't God do that? So those are some of the dilemmas that have been raised in our passage today. Now last week, last week I talked about how we all had a dream. We all had the same dream. Every human being has the same dream. We've got a hand reaching up to God, the force, uh, nature, whatever people's view of God is. And people have a hand reaching out. They want a good marriage. They want a good family. They want to make a difference in the world around them. We have a hand reaching up, we have a hand reaching out. But everyone's frustrated with this dream. People aren't 
getting this dream with the hand reaching out and the hand reaching out. And so we talked about well, why is that? We talked about sin. We talked about Genesis 3, Adam and Eve. Sin comes into the world and they hide from each other. There's distrust, there's brokenness. And we've seen that ever since. And they hid from God when God came around. So we have this dream of connecting with God, connecting with the people around us, but sin breaks it, makes a mess of it, brokenness. Well, then God comes along and he says, okay, I know you want a good connection with me. I know you want a good connection with us. Let me tell you how to do it. So he writes the Ten Commandments. First Commandments deal with our relationship to God. This is how you do it. You want a good relationship with the people around you? This is how you do it. Next Sixth Commandment. So we want it. God tells us how to do it. And we still don't do it. We don't do it because of this thing called sin. So what we said two weeks ago is the only way out of this is grace. Somehow God is not going to let us stay hidden in the garden when he comes walking in the cool of the day and he's going to call out our name. Adam, Eve, Bob, John, where are you? Okay, and then the rest of the Old Testament is about the coming of Jesus who dies on the cross, pays for our sins, and makes the grace available. Okay, so grace is available by what Jesus did, but how does it get to us? In other words, the money's in the bank, but how does the money get into my wallet? What is the mechanism for getting the grace over here to us over here? On this side, I have faith and belief. So somehow, faith and belief somehow make the transaction from grace to us. We have grace over here. That's what God does. Clearly, that's what he does. We don't do this. He does 100% of it. Okay? But now on this side, God is not the one who has faith. God is not the one who has belief. We are. We're the ones doing this. God's doing that, we're doing this. So how does that work? So for example, John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That's clearly over here. God so loved, gave. He's the one doing all of this. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes should not perish but have everlasting life. So that's clearly what we do, right? So it seems very simple. God has the grace over here. How do we get it? We must believe. And then we get it. But it's not quite as simple as that. Again, it can make God make a rock so big that he can't lift it. There's a bit of mystery between, you know, I put this, these things at a distance because there's a mystery in this distance between this and that. So 1 Timothy uh, 1 verse 12. And I have to... Paul says this, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength. Okay, so what side of the podium is that? Grace. Yeah, it's on the grace side. Was given. It's a passive tense of the verb. Okay, it happened to me. Uh, I was given the strength. That he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service. What side is that? It's on this side because Paul must have done something to be trustworthy. Okay, that's what faith and belief are all about. Trusting in something. That's what belief is. You believe in Jesus, you trust in him. You believe in your spouse. You believe in your family, you trust in them. So, okay, that's one side, that's the other side. Then uh, verse 13. Paul says, even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy. Okay? Passive voice again. It, I didn't do it. It happened to me. We're clearly on the great side. I was shown mercy because, uh, because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly. Again, passive voice. It happened to me. I didn't do it. The grace was poured out on me. I'm just sitting there, and all of a sudden the grace happens to me. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. And hold it. No. No, no, no. Because faith and belief is the thing that we do. Grace is the thing that you do. And now this verse is saying, but hold it. Grace was poured out on me, and faith was poured out on me. So faith was poured out on me? I thought faith is the thing that I did, but now it sounds like faith is the thing that... God 
does. So how do we how do we think about that? First Timothy four verse sixteen. Paul says to Timothy, watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them. That sounds like over here. Faith and belief. Trust. Persevere and keep going. Could keep going in this direction. Persevere in them. Because if you do, you will save both yourself and your ears. What? That sounds like it's up to us. Right? We're saved by what we do and how we persevere or whether we don't persevere. So how, how do you think about this? Now, it, in some ways, it just seems logical that God gives us the grace that this is our part. This is what we do. In fact, that's probably how it felt to you. At some point, you said, I believe. And, and, and you're the one that said that. Someone didn't say that to you. You didn't have that happen to you. You're the one that did that. But then if someone comes along and says, well, why did you do that? Well, I did it because uh, I was reading the Bible and I felt this, oh, so something happened. Something happened that brought you to this place where you did this. So did you do it or did you do it? Or what part of you did or what part of you was led? So I, have, I wrote down, people don't just have faith, they come to faith. And how does one come to faith? So it's not so easy to figure out. Now, I was raised in a, in a Reformed tradition, Christian Reformed, that's what this church is, and Christian Reformed people tend to emphasize this. And often will exclude that. Okay? Now, if you were raised in a Baptist church, you're clearly on this side. I mean, the whole service is designed to make someone believe. We're going to sing songs that help you believe. We're going to preach a powerful sermon that help you to believe. And at the end, we're going to have an altar call to get you over here. Because you need to do this. Okay, reform people go, no, we're not doing that. It's all about God's grace. He's the one that does everything. And, then, and you know, this is like not a, not a popular position. This is way more popular than this. But the problem for reformed people are things like Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 starts out this, this way. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Okay, now, if you are dead, can you do anything? If someone preaches a powerful sermon to you and says you've got to believe and then they have an altar call and you're dead, can you do anything about it? No, oh, you're dead! Okay, so then later, verse 4, it says, But because of his great love for us, that's on this side, God, who is rich in mercy, this is on this side, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions, it's by grace you've been saved. So Reformed people say, well, look, we're dead. You can't do anything. Unless God's grace makes you alive, you can't do this. So you need this before you can do that. And then, again, how does that work? There's that mysterious line here from this to over to this. Fifteen years ago, a friend of mine, a friend of mine and I were in Romania, and we were in, we were in some remote place in Romania, and we were in a person's house, and we were with pastors and leaders, and probably 20 of us in this living room, and we were told uh, that morning that we were going to stay with some Romanian people that didn't speak English in their house. And this house, it, there was dirt floors, there was no heater, it was 32 degrees in this house. And I had a, just a regular coat, I had a little gloves, and I had no hat. I thought, we're just going to die tonight. This is how it's going to end. And so the whole meeting I'm thinking about, how's this going to go? What? Can I borrow a coat? Can I buy a coat? What, how are we going to do this? So we're talking about Christianity and all these things, and then towards the end of the meeting, some neighbor stops by, I don't know why, for something, and the neighbor was a non-Christian. Well, this neighbor walks into this, this den of bears, <laughs> and you know, all these leaders, Christianity, yeah, you know, we're ready, and then someone walks in, and every one of them, every single pastor took their shot at this woman. And I could, you know, I, I couldn't understand what they were saying, but I, you know, one did the evangelism thing that you use your finger, and this stands for this and this. So he was like, 
you know? And then the next one, I think, was doing the four spiritual laws. And, you know, and he's, you know, and everyone is getting into this. I mean, and then the next version, and the next version, and this woman is like, boom, 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 with Christianity. Because you know what? The grace is over here. <coughs> but we got to get you to do this. Come on, come on, come on, come on. I don't think she crossed the finish line that night, okay? She's like, you know, I don't, maybe she's in counseling now because of it. I don't know. But that night when we went to a place that had heat, it was great. Um, we, my friend and I, we talked about it. It's like, that just doesn't seem, is this right? Is this the way it goes? Is this how it should be? And, we, and at the time we were talking about things like talking, listening repeatedly, getting people into the word of God as a form of evangelism. How do we just get people started with a walk? How do we get people to date God? We were talking about all these things. And then we experienced this. And it was like, this is not where we're at. So we started looking at the Bible. And we looked at John chapter 3, the, the passage where Nicodemus, Pharisee, comes to Jesus, wants to know how to be saved. So it's the salvation chapter in the Bible. John 3, 16, the most famous verse in the entire Bible is in the middle of that. So we started reading that, and we came across uh, John chapter uh, 3, verse 8. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Okay, the Spirit somehow is involved from over here to over here. We, you know, when we know God is over here, and the grace of the Spirit is doing things, He can do it through people, He can do it through the Word, He can do experiences, all kinds of things, and somehow the Holy Spirit is all around this. Okay? So the Holy Spirit somehow makes these things happen, but it says that the wind blows where it pleases. We don't control the Holy Spirit. That's step one. Step one, you have to understand that we do not control the Holy Spirit. We'd like to. We'd like to come to someone and say, if you do this, if you say this, this is what's going to happen. We want to be in control. We, we, we want, you know, if I pray for you, then this is going to happen. See, I, I want to I be in control. But this says, the wind blows where it blows. You don't control the wind. You don't control the Holy Spirit. Now that, that doesn't sound good. Because then why should I do anything? Why should I share my faith with anyone? Why should I even bond with my own children? If God wants to save my children, the wind will blow where it blows. And there's nothing I can do about it. So what's the point of doing anything? So that's the logical conclusion. I remember talking to my father-in-law some years ago, and he was telling me, you know, when he was a kid and at school, he went to the public school, and he's telling me, he's telling me the games that they played with the kids, you know, with marbles, and he said, with a jackknife. You know, back then, you could take a jackknife to school. Every boy had a, a knife in his pocket. What a beautiful world that was. <laughs> so he's telling me all the games that they did. You know, they all names for all these things. And then he said, you know, and one of my friends was Bobby. And Bobby with this and this and how he did it with the knife and so on. And then he all of a sudden stopped. And he said, you know, Bobby wasn't a Christian. And then he said, but I never worried about it. And that was it. Well, my father-in-law was a staunch, reformed person. He was a farmer, milked the cows at 5.30. He'd get up at 5 o'clock and read Calvin's Institutes for a half an hour. So there's this notion, you know, the wind blows where it blows. God is in charge of all of this. God is in charge of all of this. And that's the way it is. But then it's like, well then, you know, like, you know, why bother with Bobby? If God wants Bobby saved, he's going to save him. And what, is, what does that have to do with me? And that doesn't seem right either, does it? So we kept reading this verse, the wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear it sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. We don't control the wind. We don't control the Spirit of God. We don't control God's grace. But, but, we 
do know where the wind typically blows. Right? I don't control the wind, but I know where it blows. I used to live in Chicago. What Chicago is called the, the Windy City. Do you know why? Because of politics, right? Yeah, yeah, there's a Chicago, you know. But if someone was coming to Chicago, they wanted to experience the Chicago wind as they think about it, where would I take them? Where would I take them? Downtown. What? The bean. The bean. Yeah, downtown, right? Because the, the, those buildings are like canyons and the wind whips through those buildings. Now, so if you came on, and you want to experience the wind, I'd say, well, let's go downtown. Now, I can't guarantee that when we go downtown that the wind is going to blow because I don't control the wind. But there's a good chance that you're going to experience the wind. Because this is a windy place. So what are the windy places where the Holy Spirit tends to blow? That was our question. But we came up with four areas. Number one, knowledge. Knowledge. The windy, a, a windy place is knowledge. Knowledge of the Bible. Knowledge of Christianity. Knowledge of the doctrine. No, knowledge of, of uh, church history. The more you learn about these things. Now, that doesn't save you. Okay? Knowledge doesn't save you. Jesus saves you. God's grace saves you. But knowledge is a windy place. Now, I can't guarantee if you read your Bible that God is going to save you. But I can tell you that reading your Bible is a really good windy place where the Holy Spirit tends to blow. So 2 Timothy uh, 3, 16. Uh, this is this next week's reading. Here Paul says to Timothy, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which were able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. What is Paul saying? Keep reading the Word of God. Why? You've, you've been reading it since you were an infant. It's a windy place. But now the mistake we sometimes make, and this is, this is kind of the reform Perspective. Reformed people are big on knowledge. You got to know your Bible. You got to study the doctrine. Um, there's three big, powerful uh, Christian uh, publication departments. They're all started here in Grand Rapids by Dutch Christian Reformed people: Zondervan, Baker, Erdmans. The the most popular uh, English translation in the entire world was started by Christian Reformed people in Chicago. It's the New International Version. We're big on knowledge. Christian schools all over the place. Now, knowledge in uh, the hypercatechism starts out, what three things must you know? Knowing, learning, education, all these things. Now, the tendency sometimes is to think that that's what saves you. Reading the Bible saves you. Reading the Bible does not save you. Listening to sermons does not save you. Jesus saves you. But it's a windy place. But it doesn't save you. It's not a silver bullet because, I mean, even the devil knows everything about God. Everything about the Bible, it doesn't help him. Number two, commitment. Commitment. 1 Timothy 6, verse 12. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of eternal life, which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Commitment. Uh, Timothy made a commitment in front of many witnesses, and Paul is saying, remember that. So commitment. Now, if Reformed people sort of OD on knowledge, Baptists will OD on commitment. We've got to get you to make a commitment. And everything we do is going to make that commitment. A friend of mine and I once had a, an appointment with Dr. James Kennedy, who was on the television for many years, and, uh, and then he got sick. So we met with his secretary, and his secretary told us the history of things. And, and she said, you know, I was a non-Christian, and the Dr. Kennedy came with somebody else, and they came to my living room, and they presented Christ. And then she said this. It's very curious to me. She said, I could just, I could never say no to that man. And I thought, what? You became a Christian because you couldn't say no? It's like, so Christianity, you know, the, the key to get the grace over to the person is to somehow convince them through some logical argument that if you can, then yes, we've done it. So if I can get you to say, yes, I believe, 
then all of a sudden, magically, the grace comes to you. No. Commitment doesn't save you. Jesus dying on the cross saves you. Now, commitment is a windy place. It's a place where the, the Spirit uses commitment. But you know, people make commitments to a lot of things, and they don't follow through with any of them. Number three, windy path, experience. So if Christian Reformed people sort of emphasize knowledge, Baptists emphasize commitment, uh, Pentecostals and Charismatics emphasize experience. So everything is about experience. You come in, the worship and the music and the, the preaching, it's all about getting you to experience something. Now, that is a windy place. You hear a song, and that song touches your heart. Or someone's shared something. Or you're reading the Bible and all of a sudden you have tears. You know, when we sing, um, what's the song we sing? Which one? Yeah. We sing that one. It gets me every time. Now, is that bad? God uses, that's a windy place. God can use this kind of experience. But it's also a very dangerous place. Because people, other people use experience too to get you to believe all kinds of crazy things. Right? Emotion is one of the, the best ways that someone trying to persuade you to do something or believe something, they, they use emotion to make it happen. So the devil is aware of that too. So it's a windy place, the Holy Spirit uses it, but it's not the silver bullet. And finally, number four, ritual. Ritual, 1 Timothy 4, uh, verse 11, command to teach these things. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for believers in speech, conduct, in love, faith, and purity. Until I come, devote yourself to public reading of scripture, to preaching, and to teaching. And then verse 13, watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them, because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Do these things. Do these things. Catholics and uh, um, other, other Protestant Lutherans, thinking of Lutherans. They're very big on rituals. You go to a service and there's candles to light, there's things to say, stand up, sit down, sit up, stand up, uh, all these things, and we do them every week. Same exact thing, over and over and over and over and over again. Now Protestants go into a Catholic service and we're like, really? You do this every week? And they go, yeah, why? Because how many Catholics are there in the world? They haven't. And practices are incredibly powerful. But you're not saved because you read the Bible, because you light a candle, because you come to church. That doesn't save you. It's a windy place. It's what the Holy Spirit can use those things to connect with you, to get you to faith. But those things don't save you in and of themselves. So, we got Reformed people emphasizing knowledge. We got Baptists emphasizing commitment. We have Pentecostals and Charismatic emphasizing experience. And we have Catholics and Lutherans emphasizing ritual. Which one's right? We can figure that out today. We can send a message to all Christianity, and then the whole thing will be done. And we'll be united as a body. What do you think? Shall we vote? And then uh, we'll send it to somebody. Because people care what pathway thinks, right? So who's right? Evangelicals. <laughs> the evangelicals. Okay. Which one is that? All of them. All of them. Yes. All of them are right. Why? Because all of them are taking a piece of a whole. They're taking one piece of a whole pie. And what's the pie that all these pieces fit into? I'll explain it this way. 40 some years ago, I don't remember exactly how many, I was at Calvin College. And I was in line at the cafeteria, and at the front of the line of the cafeteria was a pair of white pants. <laughs> and the white pants looked good to me. So I wanted to get to know the person connected to those white pants. So I asked a friend of mine to ask her roommate to ask her. Because you don't want to be turned down face to face. It's better to do it through someone else. <laughs> she, she, she said yes. Okay? So we went on a date. And what did we do on the date? Talking. 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 Listening. Well, we did talking and listening at first. 
repeatedly came later. By the way, we've been married 40-some years, and we're still talking and listening. She does the talking, I do the listening. <laughs> Think it's the other way around? <laughs> Everyone thinks my wife is so nice. <laughs> you have no idea. You have no idea. I mean, she'll even say that to me. Everyone thinks I'm so nice. Anyway, that has nothing to do with anything. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so we went on a date. We did the talking and listening repeatedly. And guess what? I got a little knowledge. I had a little experience. So what did we do? We kept on with the ritual of dating. And we did that for two, three, four months. Five, six months. Finally, after six months of knowledge, experience, we were ready to make a commitment. Six months later, we formalized it you know, on our wedding day. Okay? So these things, these windy paths, the, the, the paths that the Holy Spirit tends to work and make things happen, knowledge, commitment, experience, ritual, all these four things are part of something bigger. They contribute to what? A relationship. The relationship is what all of this is about. It's somehow in a relationship with God that somehow grace, the Holy Spirit, belief, and faith, all of this somehow happens in a relationship. It doesn't just happen because you make a commitment. A marriage doesn't happen just because you make a commitment. You make a commitment, yeah, yeah, whatever. It's over the years that things happen. Talking, listening, ups, downs, trusting, things, good things, bad things, all these things happening. And somehow the grace of a relationship happens in the middle of all that. It's not just, you know, believe something and now it happens. It happens over time. It's a relationship. That's why we talk about this talking, listening, repeatedly thing all the time. The reading the Bible is not just reading the Bible so that you can have knowledge. It's so that you can have a relationship with someone. We, we have camp outs and do things here at this church because we want people to have a relationship with one another. Relationship is what, all, what's a, what, what, what it's all about. So what makes a saving relationship? So we're back to this dilemma. Can God make a rock so big he can't lift it? I don't know. Maybe he can. I don't know. Right? I don't know everything. Maybe he can Maybe he can. I don't know. I don't know exactly how the Holy Spirit does this. I don't exactly know how we do this, God does this, we do this, God does it, who does it. I don't know. I don't know. All I know is that there's places that are windy. All I know is there are places that the Holy Spirit works. So those are the places I want to be, and those are the places I want to help other people be. And how it all works out is God's problem. That's how I think about it. I don't worry about how it all works out. All I know is the thing I'm in charge of is the windy path. Where the wind tends to blow. That's where I'm going to be. That's where I'm going to help others to be. So what does this have to do with the dream that we have? The dream we have in connecting to God and we have a dream of connecting to others. We need grace because sin is keeping us from that dream. So let me end with uh, uh, 2 Corinthians 5. So now we regard no one from the worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. All this is from God who, re who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. So somehow through this whole process, the mystery of the Holy Spirit and how it works, we get reconciled to God. That's our dream, right? We ought to be connected to God. We get reconciled to God. And what does God do? He gives us the ministry of reconciliation to share it with others. That's our horizontal dream. How it all works? I don't know. Somehow, it's just amazing grace. That's what it is. It's grace. But the amazing part is how it works. You know, when you're amazed by something, usually you don't understand it. Wow, that's amazing. 
which means I just don't get it. That's so amazing, it doesn't make any sense. Well, that's what grace is. I wrote a song a few years back. I've sung it everywhere but here. So I thought, you know what? I should sing it at my church. So let me try it out. Okay, D. How does this work? Bad shoulder. Oh. I'll use a pick this time. All right, here we go. All right, here we go. understand how it even came into our lives. I mean, we, we may have stories, but how did it work? How did you orchestrate it? How did you work in the lives of the people around us? How did you work in our lives? The good things, the bad things? How did you bring us to this place where we trust, where we believe? 
And then sometimes we, we don't trust, and sometimes we don't believe, and then you pull us back in. And you're like the prodigal father waiting for us to come home. All we can do is marvel and be amazed by your grace and to thank you for it. And if there's someone here who hasn't experienced that amazing grace, help us put them on the path, the windy path, the path, the path of knowledge, the path of commitment, the path of experience, the path of ritual. Help, help us get them into the word. Help us get, in, get them to these windy places so that your Holy Spirit can do its work. And we pray that that would happen. In Jesus' name. We're going to end with a closing song. Not sure what it is. A blessing? That's a good one. Why don't you stand as we sing? The last service we just ended, so we were all thinking, oh, we're done. <laughs> so we're next.
for the blessing, Bill. All right. So you can go. Um, we'll see you again next week where we'll talk about habits. Amen.